Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include Beardy Soup, Hive-Minded Robots, and Expletive Prompting Pickles as we explore remedies to burnout here on Created Things. Bienvenue and welcome to Created Things, the only arts podcast hosted by two guys who are toasted, zooted, and shall I say zonked. I am artist mm-hmm. and psychotherapist Jacob Flores Popcheck. With me as ever is my co-host and my pal, Father Gabriel Toretta. How are you doing today, Padre? Pretty feeling pretty pally, I gotta say. Um yeah, yeah pally. Matey, um, oh, we're going pirate. We're going yeah. piratey on this. Me yeah, yeah, yeah. Me hearty. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. Without the Y, you're just like British, you know. But with the Y, it's like I'm a pirate. Oh yeah, that's true. Well, right? I mean, generally speaking, there is only a Y. But for the grace of Y, go we. Right. Go where? We yeah, but we'd be be English, which would be right. There's only a Y separating that. me and piracy at any yeah. given time. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And so, as in why not? Be a as in why not? And now you're a pirate. Look, that's that's how quickly it happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like George Bernard Shaw, right? I, some some see pirates that are and ask why, and I see pirates that never were and ask why not. Awesome. <laughs> That's that's not proof. Yeah, that's great. I respect that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's exactly how he put it. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what he said. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's yeah, not paraphrased at all. Yeah, seems right to me. Well, it's good to talk to you again, buddy. We have taken um, something of an impromptu but very necessary month off from the podcast. Uh, basically, the whole month of November. We did our pumpkin carving episode at the end of October, a lot of fun, and then proceeded to basically take off the month of November. Um, A couple of those reasons. I used it mostly to grow my beard. Yeah, you did. You got very, Mm -hmm. got all the frizzes going on, man. Yeah. You grew your uh, hair back in too. You were nice and and waxy last time I spoke to you. That's because it's, that's because it's no shave November or something, which I'm still not really sure what that's about. But um, since I live no shave life, um, you know, normally it doesn't really notice, I don't really notice it. But, uh, but then I, 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 I completely neglected all personal hygiene for the whole month of November for reasons that we'll talk about. Um, And so here we are. You do sometimes do this though, where you'll sh- like show, you'll do that dad thing. Like when a dad shaves his beard and like babies don't recognize <gasps> the dad anymore and cry. Right. Like you do do that on occasion. Like I remember you showed up to a talk once that I attended and you had like severely trimmed your beard and you were unrecognizable. You looked 20 years younger and quite yeah. a bit nerdier. And I was like, Oh my God, what the what heck is this? Yeah. Right. And you exactly. do this every once you. in a while and men do this every once in a while where we shave our beards. And my goal is the next time you do this to get, just get like one, not even a full day, but just one photo of you completely shaven except for the incredibly long mustache that you have <laughs> i've done that i've done that yeah because it's really it's really I mean, they're, they're, so they're, bad. They're, they're, I mean they're basically cat whiskers at this point like they, they jut out they jut out about as far if i actually pull them out they actually pull about about as far away from my face as cat whiskers do so which is good because that way i can tell if i can get through a space you know i can just like if it if my if my whiskers can make it then i can make it I just right it. when you're trying to climb through the tiny corridors of your 15th century monastery that you live in yeah exactly um there's a, there's a lot of yeah using having whiskers um you know that that have whisker function i think is, is you know it's an underrated underrated tool now that uh, now that men are not supposed to have whiskers you know would you so. gener- would you generally describe yourself as being uh, broadly cat like is that no. is that a thing that you would use? No, not at all. Yourself? No, I'm highly, I'm so, highly clumsy uh, and have so no flexibility. Thing, so that's, that's your it's just one whisk, it's, area. It begins with whiskers and it ends with whiskers. But um, but I do have whiskers. I also like lying in the sun. Oh, okay. Well, that, there's so two things. So two things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bowls uh, of milk. Are you a fan of bowls of milk? Um, no, the beard makes bowls very, 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 very tra- tra- traumatic. You know, the thing, you of, do one like, thing about you do like sardines. I do. You, love you sardines. famously like sardines. That's a I cat-like like, thing. I, that's that's probably true. Yeah. Um, I know. Like a cat. Once I got the, once you get the taste of sardines in you, you don't want anything else. Um, well, I feel like whenever I saw a cartoon cat growing up in a book or a show or anything, they always had like a like a sardine can out of a trash can and like yeah. one of those fish bones yeah with, a, just with, with their hands yeah exactly yeah and a perfect uh, yeah. circular skull hole yeah exactly that's yeah that's that's how it is yeah 
Yeah. Um, yeah. In Austria, it turns out to be the thing that like um, really the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, in fact, um, because one of the guys here is from Slovakia, uh, which is, I mean, it's, it's, right on it's, pride. It's uh, it's just over the just over the border, really. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, uh, anyway, that whole cuisine culture is that like you have soup at every meal. I mean, at every every dinner, every main meal. You know, oh. like has to begin with but but like soup is is basically never the main dish but you you like it is expected that you have soup um like a soup oh, course and then like the rest of the meal and um uh which is delightful it feels very kind of like cultured also feels a little like it it, it hasn't stopped seem, seeming a little bit confusing because like when I, when you go to a restaurant in America and like they at the you order soup it's sort of it's always sort of like oh yes I'm souping i'm supping <laughs> i'm i'm supping with my soup you know like there's no particular reason you do it you just like oh well. i never like go to a restaurant and be like you know what i want i'm definitely gonna get some of that soup though yeah it's like it's always the thing that you get as opposed to salad along with your breadsticks at the olive garden. yeah like, like you can either you get like you can get a super salad mm-hmm. <laughs> or you can split those <laughs> into two things right <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. yeah, so you've been drinking a lot of meat. I see. I've never been a soup fan. I I kind of feel like it's just meat tea. Yeah. Really. Well, there's there's and those that, things or 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 um, liquid vegetables as the case may be. Um, yeah. Sure. But I can tell you that like once once your beard like enters like full scraggle mode, um, mm-hmm. you probably you, you can't really tell because of the angle, but it projects forward pretty dramatically. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, this becomes a really dramatic situation for soup situations. Um, for one thing, it is long enough that I have to make sure it's, I'm not dipping it into the soup. Um, and then for another yeah, one, oh, yeah. like, um, I feel like it most, like I'm an adult and I have not spent most of my adult life, like wiping soup off of my body. But like every time I, what? every time I eat soup with my beard, I spend a significant portion of that, like wiping soup off of the beard. <laughs> Um, so I feel like this is not that, user error. It's, it's like, um, it's a, it's a, it's that a, might be a, a you a, thing is what you mean. It's a fashion struggle. No, no. Like the struggle is real. I want you to, I want you to validate the difficulties of, of my life choices. I do um, validate them. I just suspect they might be unique. Nope. Um, nope. Uh, I checked and, um, everyone who has my beard, um, has these problems. I see, but no one, no one really has your magnificent, luxuriant beard. So well, I checked. I'm speaking to the limits of my knowledge. I checked, and everybody who has my beard has these problems. <laughs> so um, it's important to speak to a the sur- limits of your knowledge. Survey says now. Survey only had one participant, but I'm it not. Was a I'm not allowed the- to disclose um, the numbers of our recipients and or whether everyone that we asked replied. I'm not allowed to report that. That's amazing. So, amazing. Yeah. That could take me into so many places, but um, you had had said that the reason for growing out your beard had to do with the reason why, uh, at least one of the reasons why we've we we took off November, and why we're returning with the episode that we're returning with now. Um, you wanna you wanna use that to segue us a little bit? Yeah, basically. So um, J- Jake and I had a little convo the day after maybe we were shortly after we recorded our last episode on pumpkins and how to pumpkins. stab them Pumpkin, how to stab them um <laughs> and uh, of our forthcoming memoirs yes it's actually holy crap that's pumpkins really good and, how to, and how to stab them um and uh and realized that like i was feeling super stressed because i'm so i'm writing a dissertation right and i was feeling super stressed because um the dissertation chapter that i've been working on for like eight months was rapidly turning into nine months. And then kind of maybe I forget like 10 months. Like this is a, this is a very overdue baby. And like, this is becoming a health problem for all concerned. Um, and like, and I was getting really stressed out about this. Um, and, um, you also had, um, uh, approximately like, 70 different projects that you were running at the same time yeah november is always a really busy month for me artistically so like in the theme park world oftentimes november is when we are wrapping up like the stuff that definitely should have gotten done in terms of um big christmas type oh is that right like the majority of those things why why, yeah why november but yeah the majority of that like i had done in october and stuff but there were a couple of 
projects that I needed to wrap up in November. And then um, a very large Catholic organization that I can't mention yet, like got in touch with me and asked me to do a rebranding for them. And they were like, we need oh it done. my gosh, is it the Holy See? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah, it's Pope the, it's the Francis. Pope. It's the, the Pope. Pope. The Pope. Um, I didn't want to say it because well, he's a very large Catholic organization. His name is the Pope. Right. Yeah. No, but he got in touch and they were like, um, would you, re by the way, to be clear, not rebranding the Pope. Um, but anyway, this organization uh, got in touch and they're like, hey, we want a rebranding, but we need it like within a month. And then also like from a theme park perspective, um, uh, so the big, the big international expo conference where most of our networking for the year happens is, is called IAPA. Um, International I, Association yeah. of Amusement That's Parks very, and Attractions. Very, very piratical, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah. And it takes place um, here in Orlando uh, every November, the week before Thanksgiving, hmm. um, which Seems is just like suicidal, awful. homicidal. Yeah, really suicidal. Um, Something but definitely. Everybody incidental. shows up. I mean, you know, it's roughly two miles of show floor with covered in coasters that they build on site and animatronics that were assembled on site and like I mean, that's newfangled inventions and stuff. And right. um, it's just, you know, seven it's, or five straight days of total sensory overload where you walk the show floor and then you go and you go to like countless after parties to rub elbows with people. And so between finishing up the projects and then getting everything together for IAPA this year, um, not to mention then, continuing to handle my clinical caseload as a psychotherapist like i was just hemorrhaging and then you were you know desperately trying to deliver this far overdue book baby and november just sort of was this cluster of bullshittery that that just was not maintainable um and i think it also sort of at the same time you know us trying to roll out you know we mentioned in our pumpkin episode like that sort of I think the episode turned out great. I'm really proud of it. But also like there were, um, there was a guest we were supposed to have on who ended up not being able to do it at last minute. And, and it's been harder to kind of get guests lately because of the holiday season. And then, you know, just sort of coincidentally, a lot of people who we try to reach out to end up being like, Oh, well we just had a baby. So we can't, you know, sort of life events like that kind of the luck of the draw. So it's sort of the same time that you and I were dealing with all these things. It also was like, this podcast is becoming really hard to keep up with. And we sort of need to revisit um, how we're doing this, um, which, you know, is still very much in flux. Like, you know, we're doing it. We're still doing the podcast. We have no intention of stopping the podcast in case that's unclear, but we, we wanted to kind of take a month to, to focus on it so that we weren't to focus on the other stuff so that we weren't giving the podcast short shrift and like not doing a good job or worse, like growing to resent it. Um, but that kind of as, as I was going through this month, um, I was experiencing as is inevitable with the kind of like schedule that I just described a good amount of artistic burnout. And I think we right. were both experiencing a good amount of burnout, like with this, this podcast, because we were handling so many other things. And then this was sort of the obligation that we were starting to attend to, which is never how I want this thing to be. Um, and so when father and I were talking about subjects to potentially discuss, when we came back, the, this subject of artistic burnout felt like a really personal place to, to start off. You know, it's been a while since we did um, an episode that was more kind of advice driven, but I always, I always like those episodes because they tend to get more vulnerable for us as, as friends. And then also because, you know, they use our, our skills, your, your pastoral skills as a priest and my clinical skills as a psychotherapist. And, um, and because we're just sort of going through the artistic burnout thing and a lot of my my friends in the arts uh, artists of various kinds are, are also going through that with the holiday season and trying to get out orders and stuff for christmas and, and things oh, like this right sure of course. i thought you know this is this is maybe like a good like very authentic but also very necessary topic to to address um i mean the good news is i, I know from a text that you sent me uh, that you are now in a much better place with book baby than you have been for, for quite some time. Um, so that, that leaves us at a good place. Um, yeah, that's and, why and I'm, I'm, that's why I'm drinking a beer. It's cause, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm wrapping up a lot of these projects, but, but tell us, I mean, yeah, tell us where you are at with that because we're sitting here cause there is good news on that front, right? That's true. Yes. So, um, I reached a point where I was, I was coming, beginning to be afraid. Um, uh that like mcduff um my book baby would have to be from its mother's womb untimely rent um but uh you asshole 
Uh, <laughs> but it was, however, not the case um, because I was able to deliver it um, only, you know, a couple months late, which I'm pretty sure is not how babies work. Um, but we're not going to talk priest, about that. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't yeah, know. exactly. I, who would even know? Um, and uh, anyway, yeah. So I like uh, I I I turned I pump I pumped this thing out today. I turned I turned it in today, which is amazing. So I turned it into all the responsible people who need to who need to need to take a look at it. That's um, a huge deal, dude. Really, that's it's big, it's really exciting. That's awesome. it's, the, it's the it's the it's the longest thing I've ever written by by a quite considerable margin. I'd be um, really worried if it weren't. Well, it's only what it's the second chapter out of two. Um, and so I'm just talking about the individual chapter. Uh, and it's significantly longer than the first one, which was already the longest thing I'd ever written. So this is how life works. Um, when you're so the document is going to be two chapters total, four, but the chapters four. are ridiculous. Oh, four yeah, chapters. Four, so there's still more chapters. to go. You- and there's, and they're all ridiculous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, wow. This thing's going to be long. So why, why four chapters and why not divide them up into like sub chapters so that you have like eight that are more neatly spaced well it's just topic driven you know so like talking about like i I just spent nine or ten months i forget um reading and researching about this sweet bro who died in 856 um named robonis morris who really is the best um and uh you know i just he he wrote a lot we wrote a lot that was really great and I had a lot to say about it because he had a lot to say and it's just, you know, one thing leads to another. And then, and then you, you wrote a chapter that's actually the length of a book by itself. Um, sure. But, you know, you could publish it that way, but not really. So anyway, um, yeah. it just, that's, that's how <laughs> life works. Um, so, you know, I mean, I could divide it into like, I could divide this one chapter into four chapters, but why? I mean, nothing changes. It's just I think it content. was in the, um, was it in the home goods paintings episode that you were talking about? Like those, those like books on, I think it was Greek language where they're all in red and, and like everybody wants like original copies of these books and they're oh, all, yeah, the red, the and red then, and green books. Yeah. Latin, yeah, Latin, and, then Latin some, and Greek books. Latin, and then somebody kind of used them to just like be de- as like a, red as a decor. Home design. Yeah. Home right, design yeah. decor. Well, I think you should do that. I think you should publish like each subsection as an individual oh, chapter. That's such, that's and such then a good idea. Each of the four chapters is like, well, each different half colors. a chapter is a different book. Should, and then you can, then you can be that guy and just line everything up in these beautiful colors. You can even have a gradient where yeah, it like slowly true. fades from one color into another. Oh my God. It'd be I like that. And I like what I like, what I like about that is that it's all just stuff I've written, you know? So it's, I could just yeah, look at exactly. it and just think about, you know, important things like how great I am. Um, how yeah. smart I am, how much smarter I am than the people I'm writing about. All these important things, you know. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, there is, it, yeah. You have it behind you whenever you record these podcasts. Like, how yeah, yeah. Oh, be? and I'll just I'll just refer to them really in a kind of casual and understandable kind of way. Like, oh, oh yeah, you behind me. As um, yeah, that that you're you thinking about um, mermaid vampires makes me think of this amazing color coordinated series of volumes I've written about ninth century <laughs> theology of beauty. I just think you know that's how life is. Um, but yeah, so so you know, book baby's out. Uh, well, well a, a yet another chapter of book baby's out, and I'm gonna take a couple of days to chillax for a little bit before moving on to chapter three, and uh, and that's that. So um, you seem to have pushed out. Um, like a like a host like a like a like a swarm more like a swarm of projects than a baby you know like a bunch of bees several little i've hatched several little eggs and now okay. i have to raise them you know but i but, see yeah, not bees but I, I, not babies but eggs yeah i would yeah. i would say i've hatched several little birds and now okay. comes the process of actually like you know, feeding barfing, them worms and teaching them how to fly. Yeah. Yeah. Barfing their mouths. Right. Like the gross part is now, but the good news is that the like really hard laborious part of just sitting on the eggs, starving myself, that's over. This is actually a very apt analogy. <laughs> it's a, that I'm is joking, actually pretty but this apt, is actually like, like, really apt for what I'm not, doing right now. Like not, not the, bathing, starving, the gross, the gross not part moving, is hurting your starting legs for me, but the right. exhausting, awful part is over. So right. that's good. That's mm-hmm. good. But yeah, I mean, we both have deeply come to like become reacquainted with burnout over this season. And like I said, I mean, so many people are experiencing it right now. Um, and, and it's 
speaking, you know, particularly about artistic burnout, where you do this, that you get into these things, whether it's, you know, this podcast itself or the, you know, some of the illustration, theme design I'm doing, or, you know, the dissertation you've been working on, you get into it like objectively because you, you love the thing. And then you end up spending so much time with the thing that you start to not only like resent the thing, hate the things too strong word, but like you, at least in my experience, I start to resent the thing, or at least resent that I don't have enough time for the thing. And then I start to forget why I was doing the thing in the first place. Right. Um, and then I become bad at the thing as a result, which then just further perpetuates my resentment. Um, I mean, that's my personal experience of it. That's definitely been my experience of, I mean, the podcast, right. And then also some of the, the illustration work and, and graphic work I did this past month. I mean, do you experience it the same way or, or what's been, what's been your unique flavor of this with, with the dissertation in particular? Yeah, I feel like it's funny. I was just, I was just going over, you know, like the way you, the way like writing a big academic project works is it's very finicky and um, you're sort of constantly dealing with all of these details that are very, very small uh, and these very, in the, and all, you know, and so. For those of you just listening to the the audio version, not the video version, uh, Father Gabriel just did a, a kind of finger waggle that can only be described as like Dickensian, almost Fagan-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to my boogly woogly boys are gonna <laughs> take all your things. Eh? Yeah, there's some there's some distinctly finicky. I mean, if it's finger finger wiggly, you know, about like yeah, how, how finicky things have to be. You know, I like. Um, so, for instance, um, I don't know. One thing about like so, sort of writing is creation. It's funny, like when it's like free writing. You know, I'm like writing and writing in a, like a popular article. Um, or something uh, that like I want people to read. It's still it might be taxing and stuff, and it like might go slow more slowly than I want, or like I produce a different product than I was originally hoping for, or whatever. Um, but it's not exhausting in the same way because like in the end, it's like very free form, and it's cre- it is, it's this free creation where it can kind of be what it needs to be. And if I need to rewrite the whole thing, I can, and you know whatever, which is limited by time and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is like a very unfree kind of creation where you're sort of like, I said this and now, now here's like all the documents proving why I'm right. And then I said this and now here's all the documents proving I'm right. And those things might be like one sentence separated away from each other. You know, it's just like very finicky. Um, and, uh, I don't know, it's struck in different ways. Like I definitely have noticed that, um, we sort of get these waves of it. So for like a month or so, the big problem was like, I would say, well, the begin the first two weeks of November when we were first thinking about like maybe we need to take a break here. I mean, I just like couldn't. I was like frozen basically because I would like, I don't know. What I get in in this kind of work that I'm doing right now, the most problematic mode is where like I just like overthink everything and kind of can't produce anything. You know, so there's so like, like an like analysis sit, paralysis kind of a situation, kind of you. things. So I'll like sit at the computer like the whole day. You know, but like we'll produce like two pages. And it's fine. I mean, I'll use those two pages. It's not like I throw them away at the end, but like it's like oof, or near, you know, <laughs> like it's and so it's just like okay, at the end, like what I feel like when you have a day that's not very productive, but you've spent the whole day working, you know, it just wasn't very productive. Right. That's the worst feeling. It, it's like so doubly and trebly exhausting you know because mm-hmm. it's like it's like double you're exhausted because you just spent all day like wearing yourself out and then it's like doubly exhausting because like you didn't you also didn't produce the amount of stuff that would make you give you the sense of internal satisfaction and then it's mm-hmm. trebly exhausting because you realize that just means you have so much more to do tomorrow right it's very sisyphus and the boulder yeah there's also the other one that comes to mind i know you hate it so so much and i'm triggering you by bringing it up but like i have the the visual of like uh in in the movie version of lame is which actually i hate as well tell I do me love more the musical, tell but the, me more yes, I, uh, but yes, i do yes. hate the movie and like there's this the scene of like the guys um in the chain gang like pulling on the 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 I think it's like a sail that has been sunk or something. And they're that you just know, like you're working all day just to work. Like you're not accomplishing anything. You're just doing this to like, say you did it and you're going to, and like your prize for doing it at the end is, yeah, you get to do it again. 
Yay! And it's just so, Guess so what demoralizing. Had meaning. None of this. Just deal with it. Right. You know? None of it. Yeah. Just the <laughs> yeah. brutal kind of meaning. And like, that's, I think, hard for me in particular. I would assume for you, because we are such meaning driven guys. Like, I mean, the whole point of this podcast is we're trying to see me, not just project it, but like actually see meaning in ostensibly very mundane or often even silly things. And when, when that capacity to like find meaning in what we're doing gets taken from us by the actual process of the doing of it, like that is, it's really like kind of disturbing. No, that's as, right. As yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, that's a good analysis of it. You're just like, wait a second, but this was like the whole source of the thing. This is the whole source of the thing. So what, what, what am I doing with my life? You know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Um, I had this amazing moment. I had, I have to say like, um, I mean, so, so let me tell you, like I had, I had this like phenomenally, stereotypically like a dissertation writing moment um a couple of weeks ago and i would love to hear like i mean because there's all these like tropes and stereotypes of what it's like when people are writing dissertations and the, the fact of the matter is it's because it's 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 a really arduous process that lasts a really long time and it's just you know i mean people's personalities are what they are but like some of these burdens are just shared you know um, mm-hmm. by the nature of the beast and so i would be really curious what your experience of like when you have like a really difficult day or a really difficult moment where you think like, Oh, that was just such a completely typical, like you're totally like base vanilla, like either artists or illustrators or, or, or designers problem, you know, I'd be mm-hmm. really interested yeah. like what, what, what you, what you thought that what the, was or what whatever. the crossover is. Yeah. Yeah. But like, so for instance, I, I, I mean, even at the time I thought it was funny to be honest, but like, yeah, it's like talking about like psychological baggage and like, oh my gosh, I like didn't get much work done today. And now I have so much more to, to do. I mean, yesterday and so much more to do today. Okay. So I, had one of those days, but like, you know, you know, had a beautiful morning, met, you know, prayers and everything. And I was all like ready to go. And I was like, I was all psychologically set, you know, I was like all, I'm gonna have a big writing day today. Like I've got a lot of stuff. All the all the game is set, you know. Like I got all my resources, you know. I got all my treasures, you know. Got my finger wagons. I got everything I need, you know. Um, and I literally like like crack crack crack. Good. I sat down. I wrote one sentence that included. There was a new section of a of a thing. Included a date for the book that I was writing about. And I paused. I'm because I'm a historian fundamentally, and so I'm I'm trying to be really attentive, historian of theology, but trying to be really attentive to the historical details. And um, and I stopped, and I thought to myself, "Wait a second, how do I know that date actually?" And I was like, "Oh, well, I have it from a couple of different sources." And I looked at I looked at the sources just to check, and like actually, their reasons for the date were pretty bad, and so. Cutting out everything in between, three hours of like processing, like hunting down um, documents from the ninth century, uh, reading them really, really carefully, cross referencing them to other documents from the ninth century, um, a bunch of them, uh, fighting and struggling my way through a lot, like scholarship from the 19th to the end of the 20th century, uh, I realized that in fact, everyone has the date wrong because like this major authority from like 1880 uh, gives the wrong date because he bases, which he bases on a footnote based on somebody that he thought was a really major authority from like the 1860s who wrote a kind of BS book um, with some really, really dubious and in fact, entirely false claims. Um, oh, damn. And uh, so that was about three hours. Um, and then like me fighting with myself for like to keep that from to, from being like a like a two page footnote, which nobody wants um, to being like a very moderate, like five line footnote explaining that actually <laughs> this is kind of a hard matter. And here are the real boundaries for the date. And this is seems like why no one has the date right. Um, and dude, at the end of it, I was like, so wrecked that like, I spent the rest of the, I just, I, that was it. I was done. 
I literally wrote one sentence in a footnote and I was like, I'm done. For yeah, the because rest. a just, footnote took you like hours and hours, hours and hours and of hours psychic and hour. energy. And, and like just like this, the incredible psychic energy of just like the, the amount of focus and detail to realize like I have I've memorized this, I memorized this date like a year ago and I have it like dead set in my memory, but actually it's completely wrong and all the basis for it is like just kind of false and fraudulent and like it means there's a whole when I say it's this completely like dissertation writing moment, you know, is like you because like everyone has these things where you realize like Oh, I mean, it's the kind of growing up as a scholar, realizing like, I thought I already knew what it meant, like, to make my own judgments, to like, um, not just have to rely on authorities for things, but also like to be able to understand where authority comes from. And so not to be suspicious, you know, per se, for right. its own sake, but just to know where authority comes from and like what's trustworthy and what isn't and like what so especially as a historian, like what does documentary yeah. evidence mean and how strategically do we, you know, placed grains of salt. As yeah. All those kinds of things. But like you had these moments where you realize like, Oh no. Yeah. Right. But I still get trapped in like this kind of like small thinking and then realize like, wow, it's actually a ton of work to like track all this stuff down. And I just realized like, yeah, I mean, I was laughing even though I was doing, so I was just like, this is the most dissertation writing day I've had in this whole process, which is true. I think, um, God, that sounds like my nightmare. It really yeah. does. I mean, like the equivalent for me as a as a visual artist, like a graphic artist, is I think the best equivalent, and, and everybody's got a version of this, but like when it comes to the print end of things, because like okay. print terrifies me. Like okay. I will have designed this thing, and you know, you can use your Pantone colors and everything that the company Pantone sends Pro you. Well, my, like, sure, my, exactly. My well, okay, yeah, no, you. no. So Pantone designs um for those who don't know, Pantone is like they release sort of the Bible of official colors and you use like okay. their specific codes so that regardless of like what stupid, weird uh, quirks your computer monitor has or what quirks the printer has, like you can all basically be sure that like it will have these this colors. blue like this. that yeah. you have is going to like be the same blue across all platforms. Well. I mean, complicating this, of course, is that this year Pantone has started charging a individual and separate license from Adobe and Photoshop and all and Illustrator. What? And all so anyone what? who doesn't pay for that license, all of their colors in Photoshop are now just black. Um, any Pantone color you used is just black unless you pay for the license. Like literally you don't pay for the license like by one day and all your files will just have gone black. Um, so, oh you know. God. The the is the East India Trading Company of design is definitely predatory, but um, that's even before that, though. Like um, the whole thing, you know, with print is even with the Panto stuff, like a nightmare because you know you'll work forever on a design, and then when it's actually, and you'll try, you know, to zoom in on every little section, right, and and, and then it's printed, you know, eight feet by ten feet on the side of a building, and you go well shit like here is this point where like two data points crossed over each other and made a weird little curly cue in an otherwise completely straight line and that doesn't make any sense or like i've oh definitely gosh, had of course, it right sure i've yeah. definitely had it where like and i probably shouldn't even admit this but I've, I've definitely had it where like um i will send a logo to a client and like the curing on one letter will be like one point off and like they yes. won't care, I mean, but no, I will not, be yeah. seeing it and I'll go like that L is like a fraction of a centimeter too far to the left. And that's going to yeah. drive me crazy forever. And sometimes I'll catch it early enough where like I can email them and say, Hey, so sorry, I accidentally attached the, uh, attached the wrong file. Please use this one instead. Right. And like, those are the best times, but, but a lot of the time still, I don't see it until it's for some reason in like the, the Google drive viewer that i uploaded it to i didn't see any of the until time until like gq publishes it. Right. it and then you're like oh my gosh right. exactly i just made exactly. Brad Pitt look like an idiot well and it's even worse with children's books because um you know when i do a children's book i'm designing for print but i don't get to use their printers i don't get to test that oh, so the sure, first time sure. i'm seeing the book is when is it's done a month before it's hitting shows. Oh, like they'll yeah, send proofs, me like yeah, a, proofs, they'll yeah, send me. True. No, they wouldn't even send me a proof. That would be too generous, right? Like uh, I'm the illustrator. They don't give a shit about me. Like that authors get proofs. I get like the copy to send to people for 
press. Like I get the copy that's like, Hey, tell your friends about this. We can start getting a buzz out. So like I got four copies of my most recent children's book and I like opened it with bated breath. Cause I'm like every book I've done, the color has been a little off in a different way from what I wanted it to be. This was the first, the book I just did was the first book where they actually like did a color print test first. And it oh, looks wow. fantastic. It looks fantastic. The paper they used is like toilet paper. It is nice. the thinnest possible paper. So that pisses me off. Love it. I Don't love use that. thin paper for a children's book, idiots. It's going to get ripped. But I was Unless just so Unless it's a grateful. children's toilet paper book. At which right, point. Exactly. Then you it's know, dual I mean, use, right? Kids renew, need to learn. Renew, reuse, recycle. Right. Um, I mean, you got to train your kids that's, somehow. Hey, that's, that's sustainability and publishing. I'm here for it. But um yeah, like the the bated breath of being like, did I use a green that looked beautiful in all the proofs, but once they print it out on whatever cheapo paper they did is going to look bad. And then oh, and right. and no one's going to care except for other designers who could hire me for future books. <laughs> right. Like, that, like, oh, that green looks awful. What a tart. Right. That that lack of control is terrifying right. and like the, right, right, the, right, right. the little bit of human error that and the reason i see it as similar to you is like in this in the, in the same way that like i made a wrong click at some point and i accidentally put one data point a fraction of an inch too high and now there's a curly cue where there should have been a straight line and it sets off this sort of cascading domino effect of nonsense that culminates in me seeing it in the final print version like that feels like the sort of graphic art equivalent of I, you know, some guy in the 1850s cited the wrong date because he read a book in good conscience and then every single other person has done that same thing. And it's just like yeah. the way that error cascades itself is so terrifying <laughs> because right. there's just yeah, no, yeah, yeah, like yeah, once yeah. that ball, that snowball starts rolling, like there is literally no slowing it down. And when you do finally slow it down, you're like, I have fought this huge thing i stopped a hundred foot snowball that was rolling down the side of the hill but to everyone else it looks like i adjusted a data point or i wrote like right. a two-line footnote and so i'm bearing like the loss of psychic energy that comes from fighting the abominable snowman and everyone else is like you wrote a footnote today what the hell did you do with your day yeah, you suck like you just yeah. you're a, you're a priest you just you spent three hours writing a footnote and now you're like flipping through Ooh. news sites like what's wrong I with you, am you suck. exhausted yeah and that, that's a big and part it's like of like land of Goshen. No, exactly right. Yeah. Pitting, pitting that, by into the way, like, let me, let me pause you for a second. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, my, my father taught me to appreciate that the, that the absolutely best like epithet, you know, just sort of not really epithet. I mean, um, uh, exclamation, exclamation in the English language. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's testified to in, uh, Huckleberry Finn. Um, oh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certain that he didn't lots make it of, up. Uh, lots, um, of, lots of exclamations in Huckleberry Finn that you can definitely say all the time in Mixed Company, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, right. Like, for instance, some of these, some of the following start with letters. No, wait. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there's this incredible scene where this, where this is amazing, like, side, side, side character um, who is, like, really impressed by something. And she said, specifically... She's in, she's a Southern lady who is impressed at the pickles that the Southern lady who is hosting a dinner has served her. Mm -hmm. And she says, as one does, yeah, as one as is. you do. I mean, I like pickles, so I would say this. Yeah, in fact, pickles I, are great. I, have, I have said this. Um, she says, "Quote, Land of Goshen, where did you get these pickles? What I need to know land, the etymology. Land of Goshen." Of Goshen. Goshen. It feels like it's, a biblical reference, but I, it's I'm a, not It's a biblical it. reference, yeah. yeah. It's a biblical reference. Um, and to be honest, I can't actually remember what it is anymore, but, uh, oh, but it's, a biblical, it's, a, it's a biblical reference. And uh, But Land of Goshen, um, it's something good, but I forget why. Um, unless it's something bad, at which point there it is. But, um, <laughs> but it's a good I, phrase either way. But it's a good phrase, and I just I absolutely love it. And like my dad, my dad is obsessed with Huckleberry Finn, and I'm obsessed with it mostly because of that. Um, uh, and um, he has taken to using it, and so I've taken to using it as well. And it's just like it turns out to be like an absolutely amazing kind of exclamation when you just you want to express strong approval, but like you don't necessarily want people to understand you. 
Mm-hmm. Which is a which is a vibe. I like I like peppering in as many folksy phrases as I possibly yeah. can into my normal vocabulary. It it, it Land it's disarming. Of Goshen. Yeah, no, I'll I'll definitely be uh, implementing that one. I like it a lot. We are hitting on something here though, not the, with the Goshen thing, but with the um I mean of course we're hitting on something with that. That yeah. goes without saying. Duh. But I think we're hitting on something with this this inference that I'm making that for both of us, there is sort of this like internalized other i mean and this is no great like stirring realization but i i didn't think of it as i was sort of getting my mind around what advice i'd give for burnout on this episode and it's just that we both have this kind of internalized other who's judging how little we got done right like yeah that's for sure yeah that's the for fact sure. that there's only a two-line footnote like there is this faceless person who would look at that and say that's no big deal you didn't get anything done today and it's like who is that person Um, why do I listen to them? Why do I care what this faceless person has to say? Um, you know, I, I, I think oftentimes, you know, we all attach different faces to that, you know, and I've, I've heard the, uh, I've heard the phrase that like religious trauma is just when you've, I think I've even said this here, but like religious trauma is when you've arbitrarily decided to name your inner critic god um oh, but like, that's so good that's so like, good whatever that whatever it is whether it's like a false god or whether it's um like the face of your dad or like the professor or the mentor that you'd like to be more like or whomever distorted uh, you know thing you attach to this like I, I do think we can't talk about or advise anyone on the burnout that you and i have just survived without kind of questioning and pushing back on this this internalized other that can be so destructive when we're uh, evaluating ourselves yeah no for sure i um yeah and i mean so part of it is like expectations for expectations that you've made for yourself about like what this moment like what your whole life when things get really out of control what your whole life is or was supposed to have looked like um, or like what this thing is supposed to be or was supposed to be or whatever, you know, so like it, it biggest and then smallest frames, um, uh, is like one way of approaching that, you know, so you maybe say like, well, I don't feel like I don't feel like I have that. I'm not trying to impress anybody. You know, I just know I'm just myself. Like, well, when you think like, like they're like, when you feel this like real mismatch between you feel this like existential mismatch between um like what i'm what i'm actually doing getting done and then like what i want to be getting done or doing or whatever then like like what what's the ground for that what's the ground for that like is it legitimate is it not legitimate um is it is it internally held externally held i mean like one can be really dissatisfied and uncomfortable with like Things that are, and I mean, externally held, like, oh, well, I still have to do this, you know, like, it, this is still my job. This is still how I provide for my family. This is still how I do whatever, whatever. I just like, I, so I need to come to some kind of terms with it. Or is it like, this is entirely internally held and there's actually no pressure here. It's just, just internal. It's just me, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so like, even those questions are helpful at the beginning. Like, is this actually, hold on, does this exist outside of my mind or not? Question mark. <laughs> Well, and, and if it does just exist inside of my mind, is it legitimate? Like, I, I'd actually love to kind of hear your thoughts on this. Like, maybe you're, you're so far kind of along your own spiritual path that, that it's going to take you a second to kind of get your mind around it. But like, even this idea of, you know, people falsely equating the, their, their inner critic that we all have with, with God and like assuming that that voice is his, like, I, I would love, I would kind of love your advice on on how you as a priest separate those, those things, because like, I, I think it is such a common thing and it's something I see so often, whether it's with like the Christian God or just like sort of this higher power that people assert where, you know, I'm not kind of being what the platonic ideal of my particular form of artist should be. I think they're coming from similar places. <laughs> Suicidal right? barf. Like, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. And we, and we kind of touched on that a little bit in like the, uh, the torture artist thing, but like, how do you, no, and I have my own answers to this coming from a psychological place, but like, how do you know if that interior voice telling you, Hey, you're not doing enough or you didn't get enough done is, um, 
as like St. Ignatius would say, like consolative or, or desolative, like true or false, like helpful or bullshit to subscribe to. How do you know if right. that's God or, or the ideal artist or just the inner critic? Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is like, um, there is a real art. I mean, an art, you know, not exactly a science. Like it's not, um, it's not like, well, take three of these and then two of those and then divide right. by 12 and then, Put you the know, lime but in like the coconut. it's a real art. Put the, the lime morning, in the coconut. Yeah and shake it all up um in like <laughs> learning to recognize like scene i feel bad pause scene why do i feel bad it's like well this thing just happened or is actively happening i don't like it it makes me feel bad <laughs> think and be like okay um is this because I've done something socially awkward? Um, is this because I've done something morally bad? Is it because I have, I'm, I, uh, something has happened externally that I don't like? Or is it because somebody else has done something either socially awkward or morally bad? You know? So your and like, response if is I can, sort of- If I can pause, if I can pause the scene, not which you usually can't in the moment, to be honest, like mostly, mostly this is a, re, this is a ex post facto is like, wow, I just had this interaction. And like, now I'm sitting in my room by myself and I feel like crap. And it's like, hold on, but let me pause because like, um, feeling like crap can be said in several ways, you know, mm. and like, and it actually turns out to be really, 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 really important. Um, that I learn to be able to recognize, um, to put in their appropriate senses, um, like the different parts of my person, and to recognize that, like, um. Just because like I feel a certain way, like because I think this is partly what's hard. Like honestly, if I do something morally bad that has a certain embarrassing component, especially if it's slightly public, that's probably not going to probably not going to feel any different than if I do something that's just socially awkward and has a public component. Mm -hmm. So just like, how do I feel right now? That's not in, it's not enough. You say like, well, so one of his, if one is a very devout Catholic or a certain kind of devout Catholic, then I might say like, well, I feel bad about this. I feel guilty, which is to say, I feel guilty about it. Uh, so I'm just going to mention it in confession. I'm going to bring it up in confession. Um, well, not always, I mean, do what you want in confession, but like not, not actually always helpful, you know, because like in point of fact, Take like, it. You heard it here, folks. Do what you want in confession. Do what you want. Yeah, I did not. I do not. I don't, let me say, you, do not. Do not do what you want in confession. Actually, I could, I could talk. I could talk for hours about this. Um, because a lot of it is actually recognizing this. Like, uh, I, I'm not one of these priests who like tries to convince people like not to go to confession or like to like. Oh, it's not a sin. Don't convince. No, but I mean, just like. But like, there's this really important thing about like honesty with myself that like I'm not being quote more honest or more tough on myself if i just like call everything that makes me feel bad a sin yeah or or from a non-catholic perspective for for our non-religious or non-catholic listeners listening like if i call it all an, an inadequacy right yeah. like i need uh, i need to have some kind of razor or litmus test yeah. to check like these self perceptions against that and 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 i think you're making a really good point like there is i think there is this assumption that people have that if they're being kind to themselves they're bullshitting and therefore the meanest thing they say to themselves is, is probably the, truth the truth thing that's the truth right thing. it's like and that's a that's child. a really that's a really child. backwards counter inference to, it's, to deduce but it's super but it's super people think that 
that the hardest thing is the best thing. The thing that they like the least is the thing that will be best for them, either because like God, God will like it the best, or because it will just be objectively best for them. Um, like I literally talk. I think I've brought it up, but one of the worst things I've ever heard in a session is I talked to a young woman who said, you know, after I sort of explained this idea that like she had her entire life never done a single thing that she wanted to do Mm -hmm. because she just always inferred that God wanted her to do whatever the diametric opposite of what she wanted was. And like, she hadn't actually like prayed about that. She didn't have a particularly well-developed relationship with God, obviously. Right. But like, Mm. there was just this inference and I'm not trashing her. It's like really sad. And you know, she was a good person, but like, there's this assumption that like, if I like it, it's probably gotta be bad. yeah yeah gotta probably be bad. bad i should infer bad. the opposite yeah. Yeah. and like from an artistic and even a secular perspective like that no one's free of that impulse to just connect i feel bad about it therefore it's probably sober and true and i should take it at face value and i, I think you're really right when you're sort of i mean central to what you're positing here is like you need to counter the first step to countering burnout is actually giving yourself time for reflection. Like as, as much as you probably feel like you've got to keep working nonstop, setting aside 10, 20, 30 minutes at the end of your day to kind of take stock of everything and analyze some of the more specific sentences that you're feeling like crap is speaking to you, not just sort of accepting that you feel bad, but like actually delving into, okay, what is the specific message that my brain is sending me here? And then comparing that to what you know to be reality and comparing that to the truth and giving yourself that time to reflect is like extremely important because you are ultimately puzzling through that and processing it either way. But in one scenario, you are, processing it in the background like an like an app going in the background of your phone draining your battery and in the other you're like focusing on it head on and and actually doing it well and and i think being able to kind of narrow it down i i really like your idea of kind of going through each of the categories and saying is this a moral thing is this a social thing is this like trying to kind of narrow it down first by subcategorizing it but i just think even the the act of saying i'm going to not accept this but hurt feeling at face value. And I am going to take some time each day ritualistically to self reflect is like such a hard thing for people to do, but it is just so fundamental to actually beating burnout successfully. Yeah, I think it's fair, you know, and like it's sort of, it's especially fun. Like there's a fun sort of valence for, for me right now because on this right now, because um, like, you know, I mean, I'm a, reasonably extroverted person i i like talking with people i don't very frequently feel myself like sort of completely at a loss to talk to people and like if i'm talking to people i know especially i'm never going to feel like oh my gosh what do i like i want to say something fun right now but i can't think you know that's just not not an ordinary circumstance for me like pretty fluent speaker pretty whatever all this kind of stuff um and like okay fine um but like there's this fun extra dimension when like you're doing everything in a foreign language where it's like, um, oh, actually, like maybe I'm like I'm not I can't be as like naturally fluent because um, it'll take me like I can't just like blast off a witticism at like exactly the right pace and timing, you know, because the timing will probably be a little bit off off. And like, I might stumble in the middle of the sentence and that might actually ruin the whole joke. In fact, you know, sure, yeah. and that's the timing and everything. Um, and then also like, I'm going to be making grammatical mistakes, like through combos and stuff like this. And like, it's, there's like a, like a humiliating, but I mean, like, I'm humbling. Maybe it's a better way to put it. Like there's actually, there's a very good dynamic to this that kind of forces you. It forces one if, well, it doesn't force one. Nope. Nothing forces you to do anything, but like, it's an invitation, uh, to this kind of um, growth and spiritual and psycho- psychological maturity because, um, you know, have some great convo with like priors or like some person or whatever. Um, in fact, I had this really great experience where it was like the social, social engagement and, um, you know, had these random, just, it was a big party basically. And so had, you know, three, five minute, three to five minute conversations with, you know, a dozen people or whatever. And, afterwards i felt this like weird mix like just just speaking about this like internally i felt this weird mix of like ugh, 
I'm awful. And then also like exaltation, like I'm the best, you know, like <laughs> I'm the best, you know, that's pretty much what we exist in. I think you and I, yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. There isn't any, there's no, there's nothing between that. That's obvious. And, um, and like I was parsing through and I realized like, oh, it's because like, you know, it's like a party. And so you're, you're just talking to people for like a few minutes and then you never see them again, you know? And I realized like, oh, it's because three or four times, like if I talk to say 12, if I had like 12 interactions and like three or four of those times, I screwed up somehow in some significant way linguistically and people could figure out that I was not a native German speaker. Um, and I was really upset. I was really frustrated about that. Um, and I was really frustrated that like, I had to admit that I wasn't a native German speaker, um, because they like caught me, you know? Um, and then mm -hmm. like the rest of the times we just had this like jamming convo and it was all great, you know? Um, and it's really great because here, like there's very clearly, very clearly, absolutely no moral valence whatsoever whatsoever this we're just talking about linguistic facility it has nothing right there's to no do. you're not a bad person for not, not speaking bad, german flawless and you're not a yeah. good person because you speak it well it's complete bs like we everyone speaks a language you know i mean like uh, who cares who cares yeah. but it's a big part of what i'm doing here so like i mean i care like i care it's important but it's but there's no there's no it's I'm not better because I'm better at the language and I'm not worse because I'm worse at it. It's just, it's just a thing, but unreflectively, it feels like that. Like it feels like I've committed a big social gaffe or, and, or it feels like I've done something that I consider to be wrong. You know, like if I just mm -hmm. like walk back to my room and think like, why do I feel bad? It's like, Something went wrong, you know, and you're just like, well, like basically you're like, you're, you know, it's like you're looking at some sort of like, um, like a, like a, how to, like a, a panel of buttons, how to fly a ship from like the first Star Trek or something where there's like all these lights, but there's no labels. You're just like, well, I can tell that a bunch of lights are off, but I don't know why, <laughs> you know? And so like. Right. Um, so I, I, I bring this up just as an example, like if, if people are confused or, or don't find like the a sort of like Christian moral language or something very like, completely intuitive. Like here's something that's just completely, completely morally neutral where like you have, but in the end, like this could be extremely psychologically and spiritually damaging. If like you don't pause and like break that stuff up, you know, like I, I realizing like, Oh, I actually have to give myself time to recognize like, Oh, I feel bad about this because like, these couple of situations, like I, I, I made these mistakes and like, yep. Okay, great. Mm, cool. Um, and I feel good about these things because like those didn't happen and like that feels great. And yeah. then we just move on with my day. You know, I'm not going to be, obs there's no reason to obsess about it one way or the other. And if I find myself obsessing about it, like that's totally disordered. Like there's no reason to, you know? And so like, um, but that's part of it when you say with burnout and stuff is just say like, you know, um, it, Again, to recognize like, okay, I'm feeling this way. There's something, I'm not going to blame myself for feeling this way, but just like, let me just pause and say like, this feels like, I don't know about you, but like burnout like and like overwork and stuff feels like this big unsolvable tangle of cords and mess and like this big like spaghetti pasta thing like pressing down on you and just like oh there's just so much tangle and mess here it's just blah yeah. and it's just blah but like if you can actually sort of like begin to recognize patterns in it and like pull kind of pull things apart a little bit then it, it doesn't yeah feel bring the same it down way. to it right break it down on subcomponents i mean it, it's it's interesting you you use as your example like going around at this party where you're not speaking german perfectly because there's there's actually a psychological discipline called parts process that I always use with with my clients for precisely this issue where you you actually sort of personify the subcomponents of of yourself and you you have them dialogue with each other in in written scripted form. So like I will I will sit there, you know, for example, and I will say, okay, um, I'm feeling, you know, to go back to you know sort of the artistic burnout thing, like I'm feeling really crap about how much I got done today, or I'm feeling really crap about the quality of the podcast we recorded or the painting I made or what have you. Right. Okay. So what does like, what does my child self say about that? 
like the little the little kid that was seven and wanted to be an artist when he grew up like what does he say about that i'm going to write down what his response to that prompt is and then like what does um what is like this more critical part of myself that drives me forward say and like what does my fearful self say like the part of me that fears what's going to happen if this falls apart what does he say and um what does like the ideal self like the guy i really want to be like the artist i really want to be what does he say about this right and you know from a catholic perspective like christ is at this party too and like what does jesus have to say to me about like this failure that I think I'm experiencing and like, what is, what is my dad or what did like that art teacher, what do they say? And like, I can start to see like, who's saying the really negative shit and who's saying the positive shit. And more importantly, because I'm not just trying to say only listen to the negative or only listen to the positive. I can start to determine, and this is the big chunk here, this big nugget, um, who's saying helpful things and who's saying unhelpful things, because this is, this is the real key to like, I think um, measuring which voices are are to be listened to or not. It's not whether they're positive or negative. It's whether they are um, practical and proactive or not. So like a desolative voice in the Ignatian tradition, um, and I'm referring to St. Ignatius here, you know, he had a whole kind of system of discernment. Um, and and I, I kind of incorporate elements of it a lot in my psych practice, but um, like from a desolative perspective, you're never going to have anything you can act on or do anything with. It's just me like you're bad and you should have done more. Well, how, how should I have done more? Like you're bad and you shouldn't have made that mistake. Well, what should I have done instead? I don't know. Right. Like a positive voice will always say, Hey, like this is the specific thing you should have done instead. Right. So that's an example of like, Hey, it feels negative. It's critical, but it's giving me a very clear next step and therefore it's something that i can probably count on where generally speaking like if it's if it's just the inner critic if it's just negativity if it's just bullshit it's not going to give you those concrete next steps and so through the kind of the parts process model i can imagine myself with that party i can have all those people kind of in a panel all commenting on the central prompt and i can in this uh self-reflective meditative time that you and i are, are both advocating here at the end of a given work day like i can have them all kind of chime in and even talk to each other about the given thing that i'm upset about and i can start to break apart which messages are helpful and which aren't and and that monolith the big faceless snowball monster that was bearing down on me before the spaghetti monster that you described that's bearing down on me like now becomes kind of individualized spaghetti noodles that are much easier to to swallow quite literally right yeah right exactly yeah i just i would say now that's interesting to think about it that way i would just say like the only pushback i'd I'd say on that is that like um i think it's wholly legitimate um to have that what that is wholly legitimate to have a well-grounded sense of like you know what this thing i did it wrong or like I did it badly. Um, even if I don't know what it would have looked like to do it right. Um, but that I did this was this, however, we can check this option off the list. <laughs> this was a this was a no go. Oh, sure. No, no, you know, I, I agree um, with that. And I think that's I just an want important to say like caveat. Like, no, no, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. important caveat to raise. I I guess I don't I don't mean that you would necessarily know what to do instead, but you would still have a concrete next step. Like let's say you don't know what to do instead. Like let's make it a moral thing, right? Let's just put it in the moral sphere. I I I failed morally today. I I lied to someone. I objectified someone. It, okay, I don't know how to do what I should have done instead. I don't know what I should have done instead. Perhaps I know I did something wrong. I don't know what I should have done instead. But if it's a consolative thought, if it's a helpful thought. I'm going to have some kind of practical next step like, well, therefore, I'm going to go talk to someone about what I should have done instead. Or I'm going to go like research this by getting this book or like to take in the artistic sphere. It's like, OK, I don't know how I could have painted that picture better, but I am going to go research that in, in such and such a way like that critical thought isn't just going to say you suck. You should have done better like a helpful, effective thought is going to say, hey, like 
go look for an answer, right? It's going to give me just a next step to work with. It's not oh, going to leave oh, me in yeah, that yeah, yeah. Right. paralyzed right, right. Not, place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like, think, no, I think that's helpful. Yeah, because like, yeah, it doesn't mean I, I know like, next time this happens, I don't immediately have the right solution. But sure, uh, yeah. but like, um, I can say, well, that was the, that was the wrong solution. Um, and like, I'm not going to obsess with it and freak out about it, but like, well, we'll try something different. And as you say, like, um, use the actual resources I have available to try to find like the thing that's different. Right. Um, Right. Because that's the thing. Like I will hear people talk about their inner critic with, um, with art, with even, you know, morally speaking and, and, you know, it will inevitably just be like, the only solution it's offering is paralysis. Like you sucked at making that sculpture. So you should blah. suck less or you should yeah, suck less or, or stop you being suck. a sculptor yeah. or yeah. kill yourself yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like, like yeah. it's, it's a, it's a stopping of motion. It's a ceasing of motion when that critic is not to be listened to. The only time it's supposed to be listened to is when it's giving you what the next step to continue the momentum of the motion is. So it's like, you suck. So do this. Okay. Well, that, that's my next side quest in this video game of the artistic journey or the moral life or whatever. Okay. I know what my next step is. I don't know what the rest of the journey is, but I know, you know, in this video game, I'm going to go see like the next npc and talk to that person right and and rather than just pause the game or unplug my tv you know what i mean right so that that i think is really important um before we before we wrap up though because we're talking a lot about the critic part of burnout and i think that's that is like the majority of the equation here right because realistically you're only getting burned out if you are actually kind of criticizing yourself for not doing it well enough um you know if you're not criticizing yourself you might be overwhelmed but you're not going to be burned out (laughs) right fair point yeah fair point yeah um but the part of the overwhelm that's here i do want to touch on it's it's the lesser point but it is important and i think we evidenced it with this podcast is like it's okay to take a dedicated break from this stuff like there is this, this, the same impulse that says I should just listen to the most negative voice in my head is also the impulse that says, keep driving at this until you get so burned out that you just say, I'm going to take an open-ended break that lasts forever. I'm not going right. to tell myself that lasts forever, but it will. But right? it and, will. Right. Yeah, and, right. and, you know, rather than live in the pendulum swing of you know, absolutes, I'm pushing myself endlessly versus I'm stopping forever. Right. Being able to say, Hey, you know what? Like I'm going to take a month off of this podcast. And like on the last day of November, I'm going to record the next episode, but I'm going to give myself permission to take that month. Right. And, and I'm going to hold myself to coming back so that I don't have to feel guilty about taking that month off. Cause every time I start to feel guilty, I can say, no, no, no. On the last day of November, I will be coming back to this and th- that's going to happen. You know, so I have that thing. I have that message to say to my self-critic voice that says, you're not working hard enough. Right. But I'm also giving myself permission, you know, or, or, you know, the alternative version, like I'll talk to people who, especially in this digital age, right. They're artists, but they're also influencers, right. They're having to kind of advertise themselves and run eight different social media accounts for their art and run the website and then run order fulfillments and all this stuff, like the whole kind of sales and marketing side of being an artist that, that takes you away from doing it. And like, you know, I will say like, Hey, take, you think you have to do this because this is what like a good artist does in, you know, the 2020s, but like, just don't like, just take a, like take a month and just don't post to YouTube. Like take a month and, and only post to YouTube and don't like be willing to give yourself a constructive break with a clear end date. Um, it's not going to kill your art. It's not going to make you a bad artist. Um, even on a daily basis, like you have said to me, like giving yourself permission to go read something for fun or giving yourself permission to go watch like the star Wars show on Disney plus or whatever. Like when you feel like, no, no, I should be working in the wee hours of the morning. Like, giving yourself that actual permission to say, I don't actually have to keep fighting as long as I know the specific time or date that I'm going to check back in on this thing. I think that's a permission that's worthy of being granted and and necessary to be granted when we're talking about burnout. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think it makes sense. And like, 
I think also, I mean, one thing that's been really helpful for me, it's been very important for me for the last month or so, has also been like um, recognizing like the also like the mature, serious, spirit, spiritually real sense of like, well, okay, so like I'm a priest and like, and it's tough because like I love to minister to people and I love to preach and these things. And like, um, you know, I've been living in Austria and I haven't preached for like a few months and I get to preach for the first time two days from now. And I'm really excited about it in German. And, um, I, but like, I'm not doing any ministry. I'm fundamentally like waking up and then I'm like spending 10 hours in my room writing. And then like, I go to, go to bed, you know, or whatever. And like, um, just having to like come to terms with like, oh yeah, actually there's like a, there is like a real spiritual discipline here. Like there's an asceticism here um, that's even can be like physically painful and like and psychologically difficult and stuff. And to say like, you know what? Like I, I, now I'm a priest, you know? And I say like, well, I actually, I'm doing these things because like I actually want to love God more and I want to help people um, who don't know God to love him. And I want people to help people who love him already to be able to love him better and stuff. And like, but for me, like, that's just not, I mean, right now I've been told to do what I'm doing and I'm, so I'm doing it, you know? And like, I can, I re I just realized like all as obvious as it might be like, Oh, you're a priest, you're a religious, you should know these things. But like, it was actually just really important to reconnect with this and be like, actually take time at the start of the day to like, give that to God and to, to think about it and pray about it. And to like, um, pray to the saints I love and pray for the people I love specifically, like not just in general, like, Oh, I'm praising the day or whatever, but just like, you know, I'm going to give this day, to this person, these people. And like, this is going to be part of like, like accept, you know, like accept where I am. Like, this is my ministry for the day. Like I want to be doing a more fun, more direct, more engaging kind of ministry where I can like talk with people and pray with them and talk with them about their problems and like, you know, do something really beautiful, but like, and instead I'm going to sit in my room all day. And I'm not going to talk to anybody, but like mm -hmm. I can offer that to God as an act of love. And I want to be like free in the heart to be able to love this way, you know? Well, it's, it's the, it's the re adding of meaning to a thing that, that meaning was stripped from like right. at, at the beginning That's of the conversation, right, yeah. like talk about how meaning was stripped from it. And it's like, you know, you're sort of saying, no, I'm going to plant my flag on this planet and say, no, no, I claim this, you know, I'm claiming the moon for the USA, right? And I'm claiming like, this feels like a meaningless process, but I'm going to claim it for this other meaningful thing. And I think, yeah, as a Catholic person, personally, like, I think the highest version of that is going to be offering up that suffering for someone else who's suffering or like trying to connect with God in that struggle, because, you know, presumably Christ has some parallel struggle in the gospels and I can bond with him over it. But like, even in a completely secular an artistic way, like being able to say, Hey, like engaging in this is part of it. And like, I am not a bad artist for struggling this way. Like this is actually struggling. This way is actually partially what makes me a real artist in the first place, right? Is the ability to kind of struggle through this and at least, at least bringing to that uh, perceived meaninglessness, some sense of like, Oh, I'm not experiencing this because I'm bad. I'm experiencing this because this is this is not well as our as our good you know mutual friend you know Father Clement always says like it's not a it's not a bug it's a feature right like this is part of it and like actually I can be comforted by by the fact that on some level like this is this the difficulty of this is validating and affirming to the fact that I'm a real artist for doing this you know right I, I think that's right. that's a really you know valuable thing to reflect upon for sure. Um, I have one more thought that I want to throw on here before we wrap up. Do you have any, any other hot takes you want to make sure you touch on with the burnout thing? That'd be good. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm curious what you'll think of this final kind of two cents that I've really picked up here. And this is, this is a little bit lofty, I guess, but I, I, I want to end on it because sort of present in a lot of our conversations, not just in this episode, but like kind of all of them is this dignity that we think human beings have, right? Like we're always kind of talking about like the dignity of the artist or like, you know, all these kinds of things like your unique unrepeatability and all these kinds of stuff. Right. I think the, the other big part of burnout that can happen and like, this is super central to your story about like messing up in German at this party, right? Like, 
we can sometimes put the cart before the horse accidentally in terms of defining our own goodness by the goodness of the product we were creating or are trying to oh, create. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is a big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and then we inevitably get burned out because I've now made my interior worth dependent on an exterior stimuli, right? Where the truth is actually quite, quite definition uh, definitively the 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 opposite that the exterior thing only has its worth because i'm lending it some of mine right and i think like the classic example in various anecdotes is like you know you, you we can talk to you know cows come home about the technical proficiency of um some of picasso's later works but the majority of people who are going to be buying picasso's later works are buying them because of his, his name is on them right if i painted that probably no one's buying it. You know what I mean? And that's because the goodness of that painting, you know, was reflective of his dignity was reflective of his worthwhileness. He brought his worthwhileness to the painting and imbued that painting with some of his worthwhileness, not the other way around, not he created this painting. And now as a result of creating it, he was worthwhile. Right. And in the same way, when I'm hustling to get a certain number of graphics or illustrations up at the end of the month, or when you're hustling to get your chapter and your dissertation done, there can be this temptation to say, like, I need to do this to sort of retroactively make myself good or worthwhile. Um, and like during this reflecting time that you are advising people take, being able to reconnect with the reality that actually, no, no, no the product that I'm creating is not going to give me goodness. I'm giving the product its goodness. It draws its meaning from me, not the other way around. I think that's, I think that's maybe the most vital, the most vital thing. Yeah. I think it's, a, I'm really glad you brought that up because I, that's a, it's an important aspect of this drama that we hadn't mentioned yet, which is that like, yeah, ultimately a lot of this does come down to like the way with just the gigantic temptation to like, judge one's own worth on like external achievement um and you say like i mean there's all kinds of like contemporary platitudes where you say like well no of course i know that's bad of course i know that's bad like i'm an i'm a i'm an unrepeatable snowflake you know and this and whatever it's <laughs> like well sure yeah but at the same time like you still want to be the person who's like funny and like tells jokes that make people laugh and like is able to get workout done on time and is able to impress people because this is done so good. And like, and there's That's like the, the individual portfolio and resume and all. Yeah. Those and things. there's this like individual thing that like only, you know, how much you prize, you know, or maybe you don't even know how much you prize. And that's actually part of what you need to figure out is like how much you prize. Um, um, yeah. Some of these, some of these things that are actually external achievements, but can feel like they're just internal parts of who you are, you know? Sure. So yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, being, being, being the youngest person in the scene or like being the person who works the fastest or with the biggest portfolio or who like, yeah, makes people laugh or does blah, 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 things that can just seem like, oh, that's just who I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not really though. You're still, you, this is, these are actually external achievements, you know, that usually have nothing to do with you in fact, and actually have nothing to do, um, with your goodness, um, or your achievement in fact. Um, and so like learning to like parse that out again, it's like, it's like, again, it's always comes back to like parsing out the threads, be like, I'm not saying don't be proud of yourself when you achieve something like that's really important, you know, but recognize like, again, like, oh, why do I feel so bad? Oh, it's because like, I actually put a ton of worth on like getting this thing done on time, like being the person who gets this work done on time and I haven't gotten it done on time. And I feel terrible about that, you know, um, but that's again, or, or like, or I did this thing and I'm, it's really important to me that the things that I do are really good and people are going to be impressed by them. And I showed it to somebody whose judgment I respect and like, he didn't like it. And I feel awful about this, you know, it's just yeah. like, like, actually it's really important to kind of pause and again, just to parse, you know, like. Okay, this person didn't like it. That's there. That's a th that's one thing. I feel really badly about it. That's another thing. Um, I put a ton of weight on what of my own sense of self on how people evaluate my things. That's a third thing. Yeah, I mean, the the this might sound silly, but like the the mental image is coming up for me is there's this 
cliche or this trope in in sci-fi that I'm sure you'll be familiar with where there'll be lots of little enemies like you know tons of robots or tons of like zombies or tons of whatever it is but they're all kind of controlled by this central hive mind right and like when when you kill them it doesn't do anything to hurt the hive mind but when you finally kill like the central root or the central hive mind like they die right and that's like a weird comparison to make but i almost feel like the the beautiful things i create the art i create the good i put out in the world right though each one of those is one of those little robots or one of those little zombies right and like they're not they're not giving me life like if i if i weren't me they wouldn't stay alive anymore like it it is my hive mind giving them their energy giving them their power right and and if i happen to lose one of them like i lose an opportunity or i screw one up like it doesn't change me but if something happens to me it does change all of those things Hmm. right yeah, and sure. and that i think that kind of sense of of the relationship between creator and created thing title drop is that's helpful for me to consider it that way i mean that's very much like the relationship i think we have with with god right and then that's by extension the relationship that i as a creator have with my art and i have to remind myself of that because at my most burned out you know and that is ultimately like the central thing we're trying to get through here you know for all of us but at my most burned out nine times out of ten it's because i've started to shift that gaze and think all the little you know hive minded robots that i put out in the world that they give me my power um when it's quite the opposite right and in fact it's so quite the opposite that i can afford to lose a few sure and i'll still yeah, be fine that's a helpful point yeah right yeah well we hope uh no matter how many little robots you have running out in the world that if you are struggling with uh, burnout that this episode may have been helpful to you um if you're a praying person please keep uh, father gabriel and i in prayer and we will do the same so that we can all kind of support each other in the continued burnout and if uh, you've uh, if you feel like we missed a, an important point something that's helpful to you in dealing with burnout as as this episode should attest we are not above learning new ways to help ourselves through this stuff father gabriel's got many chapters to go um and i have uh, many many uh, little baby birds to to take care of so please by all means shoot us an email or or leave us a comment on youtube or instagram or spotify or whatever uh to let us know if there are any points that that you found helpful um and in all things uh god bless and go forth and create cool things This has been Created Things, a production of Art, Soul, and Mind, hosted by Jacob Flores Popcheck and Father Gabriel Toretta, produced by Kyle Meineke and Jessica Flores Popcheck. Theme song by Federico Carranza. For more on this podcast and the artists featured, follow us on Instagram at Created Things Podcast and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are streamed.